My name is Bob Darnton. I'm the university librarian at Harvard, and I'm here to introduce the speakers uh, of this particular session who will bring you up to date about the work done yesterday at the various work streams, um, because a lot is going on, and we feel uh, an, a necessity, really, to explain to you and to everyone who is observing us from all these different points uh, exactly what is happening, because a lot is happening. A great deal is going on. Uh, in fact, it seems like an eternity since the DPLA was a gleam in the collective eye of just a handful of people who met at Harvard in October 2010. An enormous amount has happened since then, and the DPLA is now, as you could tell from this morning's wonderful talks, beginning to belong to everyone. There is no proprietorship, but it's got to get organized. Uh, so I think we're moving from a phase in which we've had vision statements and manifestos and a lot of high-principled rhetoric to a stage of nuts and bolts. Now, one of the uh, bolts that is going to tie down the DPLA as an actual functioning organization uh, is legal, that is to say, the steering committee made a decision last week to apply to become a 501c3 organization. That means it will become a legal entity and it will acquire probably a board of trustees, uh, people with legal responsibility for it, and a, an organizational structure. How will that happen? Well, happily, the uh, National Endowment for the Humanities said, we would like to help you get headquarters. Uh, we would indeed like to give you a grant of a million dollars. You should have matching funds, uh, three more million. With that total, you could seriously get into business, but of course, they didn't promise anything. You have to apply. It has to, your application has to be refereed. This is not a guarantee, but it's an opportunity. And we thought we should seize that opportunity, which means taking the next very concrete steps into a future that will get the DPLA up and running in April 2013. One of these steps will be to find an executive director. So if you got ideas about someone very talented out there, let us know. But of course, we will have a very carefully uh, operated sort, uh, search with a search committee. We'll do it right. But we will have an executive director. We will have headquarters. They will be modest. We don't know where they will be. But I will promise you they will, I think I could say this, John, they will not be in Harvard. Some of us love Harvard, but um, I often think Harvard is like the New York Yankees. People love to hate it as well. In any case, it was a, a, a happenstance that the first embryonic incubational phase of the DPLA uh, began at Harvard. That incubational phase will soon come to an end. But I would like to pay tribute to the people at the Berkman Center who have been really working flat out to get us born, so to speak, to change this embryo into a living, vibrating being. First of all, John Palfrey, who's led the work of the Secretariat, is chair of the steering committee, and then others scattered here, Maura Marks, I see, and Re uh, Rebecca Haycock, and. David Weinberger, and well, you'll meet a lot of them throughout the course of the day. They've done a wonderful job. Uh, so we are expanding, and the expansion, in a way, I think will follow the model of Creative Commons, which also began as a gleam in some collective eyes at the Berkman Center at Harvard. It's now located in San Francisco. It's a large and thriving community which is serving the whole world, really. So we hope that that kind of a model, or the Wikipedia, uh, Wikimedia model, will work for us. We're expanding, and the expansion isn't just geographical, although we would like to signal that by meeting here in San Francisco. It's also 
so to speak, sociological. We really want to reach different constituencies throughout the country. We're working hard to cooperate with uh, community colleges. We will uh, have new people coming in from the world of independent research libraries. A great deal is going on, but that means there are decisions to be made. And the steering committee has been working hard at least to get through a preliminary phase of decisions, which we will now present to you, and you will get a series of reports on what's been happening recently. First of all, Susan Hildreth will uh, give you some words about yesterday's meetings. She, as you know, is the director of the Institute of Museum and Library Services, a former uh, library director here in San Francisco, Uh, and so she will speak, and then Mackenzie Smith, who is an independent consultant, uh, formerly with MIT and Harvard, and with Creative Commons. Uh, she will bring us up to date on another aspect of things. And then Nate Hill, who is the San Jose public, uh, in the public library and a well-known blogger for the Public Library Association. So this will give you some sense of the connecting tissue between these six different work streams that have been meeting all over the country, coming up with ideas, and now are coming up for proposals for action. So I'd like to turn the floor over to John Palfrey, who will uh, be able to look after things and help you to ask questions. Bob, John. Thank you so much. So my job at this session is to spend a few minutes at the outset to describe the consensus that we perceive exists with the DPLA in terms of what in fact the DPLA is. And this is meant to be not my own personal views, but the views of uh, this growing community of people who are working on it. And then we're going to uh, turn it over to three people who are going to report out on the work streams, which is where all of the core uh, activity of the DPLA is in fact happening. And just to be really clear, those work streams remain completely open to anyone who wants to participate. It is the rolling up the sleeves and the sausage making, as Mackenzie calls it. And you know, occasionally we fight and argue and so forth. And if you want to be in the fighting and arguing in a loving and supportive and productive way, uh, join the work streams. But I want to uh, make two things clear in addition to that invitation. The first is, what problem are we solving for, or series of problems are we solving for? And then second, what are the elements of the DPLA that we've already decided will be in it, and where there are some uh, soft spots and some elements where we have to do further work? So in terms of the problems we are solving for, I think of them as three related problems. One is the collective action problem, which is lots of us in different parts of this great country and in different kinds of organizations are doing very similar things in terms of digitizing material, adding metadata, making it available. Uh, and yet we're not doing it in as coordinated a fashion as we might. You could think about this as sort of the human social engineering aspect of standardization or interoperability among these activities. This is something where Bob said there's nothing proprietary about it. There are no mothers or fathers of this effort. It's really saying can we get ourselves much more organized than we've been in the past as we do this in the public interest and can we do that? I'm totally convinced that we can. This is the can-do American pragmatic spirit and I know we can do it. Uh, solve that collective action problem. Related to that, and Nate will talk about this in particular, is really coming at this from the user perspective. As we have been digitizing materials in all of our various ways, I think very often we've put them in silos where they're actually kind of hard to find and hard to use and hard to bulk download or do other things from it. So coming at this from the perspective of human beings who are trying to access this knowledge for a series of wonderful traditional library and the wonderful um, not yet imagined possibilities that we heard of earlier, that's a big piece of what we're trying to solve for. And then third, there's a lot of material that's still not available in digital format. And there's much still to be done in terms of mass digitization. We're going to end the day with a bunch of visionary people who are talking about government records that have yet to be digitized. Even those, those are in the public domain, even though we're all paying for them, there's a lot of information and knowledge in lots of formats and lots of places that is not yet digitized. And we need to do that now and in a big push. So we hope the DPLA will be a big push forward in this way and doing it with our friends from Wikimedia uh, and elsewhere uh, as a uh, collaborator 
collaborative effort. So those, I think, really are the problems that we're solving for. That's still pretty capacious in terms of vision, um, but I think it's uh, descriptive of what we're trying to accomplish. So what is the DPLA going to be? There are five elements as we think about the DPLA. And apologies to those who have heard these five elements over and over again, but I think um, as we uh, keep pushing at them, we will uh, in fact make more progress. And what we've done in getting to these five elements is try to expand the agreement that we have around concepts. So as Bob uh, and Doran mentioned, there was one sentence we agreed to uh, back in October 2010, and then we wrote a four-page concept note from last March, and now we've got a seven-page concept note, and coming out of these meetings, we will make that even longer as we have uh, further agreement. This is posted on a wiki. It's entirely um, discussable and editable and so forth, but it's trying to get us uh, to have uh, a consensus that we're working toward. And by April 2013, we will have a functioning, working version of this to, uh, to, to describe to the world. It's not going to be done, of course, a year from now, but there's going to be something we can all push around. And that comes in these, uh, in essence, uh, a part of five pieces. So the first is actually code. Um, we heard from our friend uh, from the independent bookstore world that it would be great to have an open source code base of material. And of course, the libraries have done this for some time, but we are building an open platform with open APIs, um, completely devoted to an open source approach to this um, that will allow people to build on top of it, where we can uh, take those, uh, that code base and bring it into local libraries or into big institutions, push it around, add uh, various user interfaces on it. This is what David Weinberger and his team uh, will unveil in the afternoon session is an initial sneak peek at what we've been doing on that score. We welcome enormous um, broad participation in that effort. Uh, people who have been doing the beta sprints, for instance, have already been working with this and uh, contributing code. The key thing is nobody can write proprietary code for the DPLA. The whole point is this is shared. Um, it's a source board or a GitHub for uh, the library community and uh, pushing that forward. Second is metadata. We've heard a lot about this already, but this is one area where I think we really are pushing hard and doing a, um, already a very good job. We've got within this um, uh, platform that David will talk about, we have already a bunch of open metadata made available on an open access basis for people to use and reuse. Last week, or, or actually earlier this week on the 24th, we at Harvard released nearly 100% of our records um, for catalog records and also other metadata. Thank you, Brewster, and others who have uh, championed this. This is our gift or our first effort towards uh, realizing the DPLA. This is one institution's effort. There are other institutions, San Francisco Public. Um, I know there are others who are uh, committed to doing this and others who already have, putting all of these bibliographic records into uh, a shared repository for anyone to bulk download and do whatever they want with. We've already heard from a number of people they're playing around with it and we will continue at that. I think this is the next open access movement from open access to content to open access to metadata and uh, we hope others will uh, participate and, and join together in that. Third is content, and this is the trickiest zone. We'll hear a little bit more uh, from my colleagues in a moment. But the DPLA, of course, will have content. We've thought about this as having, in essence, two poles, and we're trying to figure out where we fall within that. Um, on the one hand is, would this only be metadata? And I think everybody says, no, that's, that's not going to be satisfying if this is just a metadata service. On the other hand, is it that we're building this one big, colossal, huge database, you know, the end all be all of all libraries to end um, the need to create any more libraries. And it's not that either. Um, it really is, I think, a set of services, a set of um, a, a network that will have uh, access to content and figuring out when we digitize materials or encourage it, um, how will we bring that together? And I think we're you know, working with various ideas of federation and network where we see um, making access to content uh, crucial for what the DPLA is. In fact, uh, encouraging the digitization of it, probably keeping of some uh, versions of it, particularly in the public domain, in a reservoir, as Carl Malamud calls it, that others can bulk download. Uh, my sense is that uh, much of the usage of the DPLA will be not just people coming through the dp.la front door, thinking that might be 20% of uses or something, but 80% of the time, people coming through the Chattanooga Library or the San Jose Public Library, where local librarians have taken the code and the metadata and the content and curated it locally for uh, specific purposes. And when they digitize things, like what Dwight's doing uh, in the Georgetown County Public Library, uploading it into this same shared environment. And that's what we're trying to figure out, something between those two poles um, that, that really does change things, but uh, doesn't ultimately uh, ignore what we know about networks and the internet, um, and particularly important here in this uh, space to acknowledge that. So uh, one is code, 
two is metadata, three is content, four is tools and services. We've also heard from others the need for us to be doing uh, the development of tools and services together. Um, I love Emily Gore's notion of the Scanabago, getting a bunch of Winnebagos with scanners in the back and library students. How many library students are here? All right, this is so great. Okay, library students and retired librarians and active librarians, we want the, you know, the, the, the core of librarians in Scanabagos driving around this country finding, finding those local historical societies and libraries and others that have content but don't have the, the technology and so forth to do it, uploading it for their local patrons and uploading it also into this shared repository. So that's one idea, there are many others. Why don't we, you know, the next time iPad apps come up, why don't we code an iPad app one time that people can script and make local um, rather than having us do it, you know, 15,000 times and so forth. Uh, and I think working with IMLS and others, these are things we can do. And then fifth and most crucially is community. I think that having Wikimedia, uh, the Wikipedia, uh, Wikimedia Foundation friends, sorry, I've tripped over it three times over here, um, it, to me is absolutely exemplary of what we are trying to do with the DPLA. This is, um, there are many amazing examples of kinds of networked organizations that have worked. I am completely convinced that the fact that we've had two oversubscribed plenary events, we've got 1,000 plus people on the listserv, it taps into a desire on all of our part to work together and to geek out in favor of creating this particular thing. And I can imagine that in years uh, in the future, uh, just as the Wikimania crew have pulled together these great events once a year that bring people together to edit articles and argue about the future of uh, Wikipedia, I can see the DPLA having such a similar thing, a Lollapalooza slash Wikimania slash let's update that metadata. And I think there are those librarians, we all as librarians and technologists, who will want to come together in that kind of a way to create a public resource. And I think what the DPLA in a sense is at its core is the group of people who wish to solve this collective action problem. We do not want to see a future that is one that is controlled by one or a few proprietary interests in this way. And we know that if we join forces as public and private agencies, um, as local and uh, big libraries, as public and private libraries, we know that we can do better than what we have today. And it ultimately is a community organizing movement. And I think that is uh, fundamentally what DPLA uh, is and will be and can be uh, with your help. Um, with that, um, we very much encourage you to participate in uh, filling in the blanks that are there. Uh, we have a, uh, another year to go before we launch this in 2013, but it will be better, it will be greater uh, for all of our participation. Um, and with that, I'd love to turn it over to my colleagues who can tell us uh, more directly what's going on. So Susan Hildreth. Thank you, John. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm going to talk briefly here. Oh, did I? Am I okay? Uh, I'm going to talk briefly. Uh, and in fact, John and Bob did cover a lot of my territory, so that's probably good. But I'm very happy to be speaking with you today and just reflecting a little bit on, on what John said. You know, resource sharing, sharing of information is really uh, at the heart of what we all do as librarians and do for our customers. And I'm going to shout out to my colleagues here in California where our dear Governor Brown has reduced, has eliminated the funding for all resource sharing, but our libraries have a history and a sense of that, and they are continuing to do that resource sharing without that funding. So we're going to talk a little bit about funding uh, in some of my remarks, but I think our uh, essence of sharing is what is going to make the DPLA successful. So we do have a governance work stream. Uh, I'm involved in that governance work stream. We had a great meeting yesterday because it was the first time we really had people from other work streams coming in and you know learning a little bit more about what we're doing. But the first thing, one of the things I'm proudest of that the gover governance work stream has done is we've adopted an open a meeting policy for DPLA. I think we've talked about it a little bit here. We had our first steering committee morning, steering committee meeting this morning that was open. We had lots of great feedback there. So we are really trying to model what we want to see in this organization. So again, all our work streams are open, all our meetings are open. So what did we talk about? Uh, what do we talk about in terms of governance? Um, it's interesting because really DPLA is responding to challenges as they come forward. So 
I think some of you have heard about this great opportunity we have to submit an application for funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities, a challenge grant. And in order to do that, we really had to make a determination about our structure. So a 501c3 is the way DPLA is going to be moving forward. But we had some great discussion about what is that 501c3 going to look like? Is it going to be a membership organization? Is it, is it going to have a board of directors? So I want you all to be assured that people are thinking about these issues. And in fact, we're acting on these issues. And if you want to uh, follow our work streams, please do that. You can see what's going on. So some of the key questions are, how are we going to plan the transition so that by April 2013, we, are, we have stood up an organization, no matter where it will be. I'm so interested in hearing about the places where it might be. We know, we think it won't be in Cambridge. That's the word from our friends at Cambridge. But um, we want to, and, and it really is all of us sharing the work together. So maybe the headquarters isn't that important, but we do have to have some kind of nexus. And I also know that everybody says, well, we wouldn't put it in Washington, DC. So we won't offer that up. Although, you know, we could have some space there to help you out. But, uh, it's really about working together and finding the best way to manage our organization. We also talked um, significantly in governance, and I know all you're talking about this too, we're going to hear from our colleagues as well, about membership and participation. What is really the value of DPLA? And I think when we look at that, we look at the supply and the demand side. We want to be able to supply material to the public, but we also want to be able to have activities that would incent people to belong. And those are issues that we're all struggling with, but it's evolving. We're moving forward, and we're going to make some real uh, good decisions, I know. We are, over the next uh, few months at the Governance Committee, going be developing our bylaws and moving forward with the 501c3. We're going to be identifying a role and structure for a board and an executive director. And as Rob Darnton said, Bringing on an individual uh, with assistance from the board and all of you is really important to move this ahead. So that's one of the key uh, activities of the Governance Committee as well as the Steering Committee. And I'll let all those librarians out there know we're taking advantage, hopefully, of ALA in Anaheim and having a job description ready for the ED for DPLA. So put your thinking hats on and we can really push this job out there. And I'm sure there are going to be many other venues, the archivists, and all kinds of places. But we are taking advantage of the timelines and activities, and we're going to really try to make that happen. So hopefully you're, you will all put your thinking caps on, too, about that. Um, also, we wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, and I'll move this forward, about our approach to, di to digitization. And I think um, John has really covered that well. And I think that that's, that's a concept that we're all struggling with. And, I think what we want to do uh, with DPLA, we really are at that continuum of providing access to metadata, metadata and digitized material, but also providing an opportunity to identify and digitize more material so that will be available for our citizens. And what Dwight did about Georgetown, that was just great. And there are many, many other Georgetowns out there that we really want to try to bring into the fold. And I'm a real believer in local content being important. Because in the internet digital age, we all see the same thing every day on CNN and MSNBC and Fox, if that's the way you want to go. Um, I don't know how many people here would go for Fox, but we're in a church, so we have to be uh, equitable. Um, anyway, we hear the same thing all the time. And what is unique is what is local and special in our communities. And I strongly believe that what will make the DPA, DPLA successful is really uh, making visible and easily discoverable that unique content. So we are constantly talking about that. And we really want to make sure we develop opportunities to take advantage of the regional, local, statewide efforts that are going on. And many of the efforts that are going on, particularly in our public libraries and to some extent our academic libraries, have been seeded by federal funds from IMLS, either through the state library program or competitive programs. So we really want to make an attempt to identify those centers of capacity and build on them to help some of our less resource libraries so they really can participate 
in this great, um, this great organization. And I think, what is DPLA? John really addressed that very well. I think we are still in the framing stages, but it's very wonderful to see so many people here who are willing to get into that discussion with us, because the more ideas we have, the more progress we can make. And we also talked a little bit uh, at our governance meeting about funding models. Um, and you know, that's a, what is our funding model going to be? I guess what we want to think about is we'll build it and the funding model will come. Um, I don't know if that's the best way to go, but we have great support from the private community. And I also think that we will be able to provide some benefits that even at the local or state level, those funds might be able to be tapped. And we also might be able to identify federal funds either in the future or federal funds that are already available that we could add digitization purposes to the use of those funds. So I think that we have many strategies for funding, but I, I really do believe that when we focus on what we have to deliver and the benefits, we will be able to determine how to fund it. Now, in the afternoon yesterday, we had a really exciting meeting, I, th I think, because the Governance Committee met with the financial and legal representatives from those work streams. And we really, I think, came up with uh, a plan that we could all work on. And I'm, this is, you know, we are constantly refining our plans and checking in to consensus for where we're going. But um, I think the, the business and financial team really felt like they had something to begin to work with as we all articulated what we're hearing more and more from you and other folks involved in the effort. So we looked at, we're looking of course at a startup phase. We wanna get that going as soon as possible so it is really uh, stood up and available to move forward as of April 2013. We're looking at a new organization, as we said, a 501c3 with a very minimal footprint. And I think we are depending on working with the power of our distributed network. And that's why it's very important for us. We know there's some nodes of capacity already and we want to identify even more so that we can create a distributed network in terms of gathering up all the data we want as well as helping some of our less resourced members to really work together. And I think if we can work with that distributed cooperative consortium based model, we will be able to maintain a fairly small national footprint. So we've looked at trying to do some general estimation of the cost of those activities, and I think the NEH grant has helped drive us to think about what do we really need to keep this effort going, and we're looking at perhaps two to five million dollars a year. And of course, we're hoping that for the first several years that will be private funding, but ultimately uh, it could be funded in some other way. That's enough to support some of our activities going, and we're really thinking about the first year, probably two, minute, two million, second year, three million, and third year and beyond, five million, to sustain a core organization. But that's really just the beginning. And I think we wanna make sure that we continue to have our huge vision, and this could cost, it, it could provide much more, and it also could cost much, much more. But we really want to try to build the DPLA incrementally. And I think that there are good business cases to do that. I really think we can start modestly and move forward. That's the plan that we really came up with with the financial stream and the legal stream. And I think it is a footprint and an outline that we can begin to develop for 2013. So we want to start modest and go big. And finally, I just did want to mention that I think we do want to, and we, I heard it a lot today already, manage expectations. We have great expectations of what we're going to do, but we also want to have some really one or two super duper things that we're going to have ready on April 2013, and we will be able to do that. When we look at the DPLA, I know Wikipedia, and it's always great to hear from Phoebe from Davis, my hometown in California, shout out to UC Davis. Thank you, Phoebe, for all the work you do with Wikipedia. But even though our, um, our program is a bit different, I think that collaboration and crowdsourcing of all kinds of information and data 
and sharing and helping our customers is really going to make DPLA work. So Wikipedia is a model we can look at, and then we'll really create all our own best practices. But I have been involved in this now for at least over a year, and I think in the last several months, uh, due to the hard work of all these committed individuals who's do, who are doing this along as their other day jobs, we're really making progress. I feel like we, we are making progress and beginning to see what DPLA is take shape, and we've done a lot already in the last day here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mackenzie Smith, and I had the pleasure of moderating a couple of the um, sessions yesterday involving the content and the technology work streams. So um, I have to confess that I'm not on either one of those groups. So there are probably things that I don't know about the history of them and um, all the hard work they've been doing. But what I wanted to report on today is kind of where we uh, are at this moment in time and what will be coming uh, in the near future. Because I think in those two work streams in particular, that's where the rubber meets the road a little bit. And uh, we're all staring down the barrel of the gun of April of next year. Because I'm sure you all know how hard it is to actually build something that will evoke what DPLA could be but not be everything that it will become, right? So that, that is a very difficult thing to do in such a compressed time frame. And uh, one of the things John didn't mention is that this is the point in time where we have to start making some very difficult choices about what you know, can be accomplished in such a short time, but still show the potential and get people really excited about what we're going to be building over the next many decades, collectively, right? So, what we did yesterday, and you're going to be seeing a demonstration and discussion of the prototype platform this afternoon, so I don't need to go into any detail of that. Just know that that's coming. Um, and also, the content work stream, Content and Scope, have done a great job of pulling together some ideas about how to uh, leverage the existing work that's out there, collections, metadata, and so forth, to, to begin to pull together a critical mass of uh, content in particular areas, I think, Immigration is a theme that's been discussed as one of the potential areas that we can all contribute something to. So uh, what we've been missing a little bit is knowing what that user experience is going to be. And I think Nate's going to talk about how that process is going in a few minutes. But we understand that, that that's really the key piece, is what will you see, what will you experience, both as a member of the public and as an institution that's participating in it. So I, I can't really speak to that. but. What we're going to do in the content and technology side is do a better job of integrating our work going forward. Right. So the platform has been on their death march to get to the prototype that you'll see today. And the content group, similarly, has been working really hard to figure out what's out there that we can pull together. And I know they're planning some surveys and things to continue that work. But this is the point in time where we have to kind of integrate these two efforts. So the commitment over the next uh, few months is to start to develop a roadmap that will be publicly available, so you'll be able to see when particular events are going to happen and how you can get involved at that point. A little warning is a good thing, usually, if, if you're being asked to give feedback and spend some time evaluating things, so we're going to do a better job of that. And um, similarly, kind of general communication about the status of it, maybe looking for people to um, experiment with early prototypes of what you're going to be seeing, so we're getting feedback along the way. It, it, this is a very open, very participatory, very transparent process, but people do need to know when to pay attention because we all have such limited time to, to share, um, and we really need help with these things, right? So what else can I tell you? Um, I think you, you will have a chance to give input on what's in and what's out of this first prototype, but just be aware that it, we have to make some choices, and not everything will be demonstrated in that platform. So you have to use your imagination a little bit, but there will be something to see at that point. And um, I think that's really all I have to share at this moment. So thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, hello there. So uh, I'm here to report back to you guys from the audience and participation work stream. Why don't I start that by making a big call for some audience and participators in that work stream. We, we, uh, we need more people. Uh, we are sort of 
moving into a different phase of things now, and I think the, the best way to look at that is that the audience and participation work stream is sort of turning into something of a user experience department. Um, we are finding that the work that we need to do in that group is going to inform what happens in all of these other work streams. And so, you know, the technical people can't know what they are making unless we have some good case studies of, of what the users want. Uh, likewise, you know, the content people can't really decide on content unless we're talking about, you know, what the users want as far as the content is. So, um, so we've gotten started, and basically, I'm going to be pretty brief because what we really realized in this very exciting set of meetings yesterday is that we have a lot of work to do. Um, and so we identified the work that we have to do. Um, and that has started as a series of use case scenarios of just people and their various information seeking behaviors. Uh, segmenting audiences and creating different sort of profiles around those audiences and then creating a narrative that goes along with that. So I think I had a slide that was maybe going to pop up that, okay, and so this is super rough. This is the beginning of an outline, but you can imagine that we would have all of these different types of users that might come to a DPLA interface of some sort. And so what, what are the problems they're trying to solve? So if we describe those in great detail, um, we can figure out where the DPLA fits into each of those things. And I'm for, this is um, just a screenshot, um, but you would be able to kind of click around on all of these things. We also discovered through conversation that we need to not only think about these end user um, scenarios, but also about the institutional scenarios with the institutions as, as end users, as participants. And so we're going to try to create a similar kind of document describing the, the whole breadth of all of that as well. Um, and, and again, we're gonna be looking to all of you to help in, inform these, uh, these pieces of this thing. Um, and finally, I think we had some really good conversation around uh, the different sort of strategic plans and missions that individual institutions have and how the different pieces of the DPLA can mesh well with that. Because if we can figure that out, then we're able to, uh, well, we're able to make things make sense on a local level. So I'm sorry that I'm being so brief because it's really, it's more that we just, wow, we know we have a lot to do now, <laughs> right? Um, but uh, I, I, I can't say enough how much we want uh, more input and more help in this particular work stream as, um, as things uh, go on from here. So thank you so much and any questions and stuff we can deal with. Excellent, yeah. thank you. Yeah. There are many people who are actually not represented up here on the screen, uh, the uh, stage, who have been working very hard. I see Rachel Frick, one of the um, leads of the content and scope uh, work stream. Of course, audience participation is chaired by uh, Carla Hayden and Peggy Red, who are uh, not able to be here. I see Paul Courant um, is chairing the business models work stream, um, and there are no doubt others in the room. But uh, thank you to those who have been working so hard on uh, the work streams. So we have about 17 minutes until lunch, and we thought this would be a good time where we've got some mics to pass around. If you have questions, hopes, dreams about the deep play and where it is right now, we can um, have that, uh, that conversation. As the mics are going around and you're thinking about your questions, uh, a couple notes from me. If you're on the live stream and you want to send in a question or tweet it, please do, and we'll be um, trying to track uh, those questions down and channel them in. Um, one clarification on what Susan was talking about in terms of budget, we were talking about a two to five million dollar kind of core team budget. That was to emphasize the, the modest footprint <laughs> right. internally, not to say we think the DPLA can be built on that kind of money. This is obviously a nine or ten uh, figure uh, kind of enterprise if we're talking about all the digitization work that has to happen. The point is only that we don't see the DPLA as sucking all of the money into a common place, but rather that we're going to help to coordinate um, these funders and get money out to uh, those who are already doing this this kind of work. So I just wanted to indicate that we're not completely on drugs. I'm thinking this is um, you know off quite so uh, so far uh, in terms of scale, but but our commitment to a small core organization uh, that we're setting up. So who has 
a question or comment about uh, where we stand? Yes, please, if we could get a mic in the middle. And if you wouldn't mind telling us who you are and uh, uh, where yes, you're Yes, I'm okay. Ellen Meltzer from the California Digital Library. You. Can you uh, tell me what's the relationship, if any, to the Hathi Trust? Sure. In fact, maybe we want to pass the mic back to uh, Professor Courant there, who uh, is involved in uh, the Hathi Trust himself, uh, but I think he's probably the best person to describe it, because he's involved in both. Um, there is no formal relationship. Um, there, I think, is mutual amiability. Um, and uh, I'm very hopeful that some of the things that you've been contributing and that we have will, will be at least pointed at and, in other cases, used more in the DPLA as it as it evolves. Um, the first meeting of the new Hathi Trust uh, uh, Board is next week, um, and um, I'm certainly not going to commit the Hathi Trust in any way um, until that meeting. Well, it's, a, it's a crucial question. That one could ask the same question vis-a-vis -vis the Internet Archive or the mm -hmm. California Digital Library or many others, and I think it's a core principle of the DPLA to be complementary and not competitive to all the great initiatives that have been going on, and I think one way to see this is as um, an, a big tent effort or an umbrella effort where we are working toward these particular uh, use cases and ideally will amplify this and so each project that has been doing uh, important things hopefully seeing themselves and individuals seeing themselves succeeding through involvement in this effort rather than uh, trying to suck all things into one centralized organization. So crucial question. Uh, Martin, yes in the back. Hi, um, Martin Gomez. Um, a while back there was a discussion I think at a previous Congress uh, conference about kind of the communication strategy. You guys have had some good press recently about the activities of DPLA. Have you started to think a little bit more about uh, communication strategy to people like us out in the field that would help us explain as well as in some ways um, not defend but certainly create better understanding among people who are giving us funding, et cetera, about what our role might be in either public libraries or academic libraries? It's a great question. Of course, you cross over this boundary now, Martin. It's exciting. I don't know, Nate, do you want to speak, since from the audience and participation viewpoint, and obviously someone who speaks hmm. to and with the public library community? Sure. Yeah, wow. <laughs> what did that mean? The voice of God, I think, was <laughs> speaking. I have a thing here. Um, well, I just said, I, a, a nod of agreement that we need to be working on communicating well. We all need to be writing about this mm -hmm. stuff. We need to be tweeting about this stuff. Like if everybody in this room writes a really solid blog post about this particular uh, incident here, then you're able to, the then, then, yeah, I don't know what that meant. <laughs> but you, you know what I'm saying. If, if everybody here writes something and, and then we've got that communication strategy happening sort of informally, um, do I personally think that we need to have sort of a, a formal communication strategy? Yes, of course, and I think we all do. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's something we're working on. So but you guys, I, write and tweet, please. Could I, so like, could I add something? You could, and then the mic's going to lose. Yeah, just well. real quickly, and that is that on the uh, DPLA Diplo website, there is a great document called a concept note that John has drafted, and he's recently redrafted, really reflecting a lot of the activity and some of the high-level assumptions and consensus we have agreed to. And I would just encourage all of you to look at that and just take little parts and pieces from it. You don't need the whole thing, but if you wanted to try to look at some talking points to share with your colleagues or staff, the DPLA concept note, I think, is a really good source to, for you to be familiar with and a good talking point. And before we go to Luis, just two additional points, Martin. Um, one is we've made a, a slide deck that's sort of a general one that anyone can take and use if you're doing a presentation. If you don't have that, we're glad to point you to it. The other is that we made a formal decision early on that from a communications standpoint, we weren't going for USA Today yet. Um, that what we're trying to do in a way is to get our act together as a uh, library, archives, museums, technology, you know, community, um, and really communicate internally. And I think actually a very important piece of that is communicating with public libraries. And um, Martine hosted a very important meeting last fall of public librarians, and we continue to hear uh, great feedback on um, how we can communicate with 
and through public libraries. But I think so far between now and April 2013, until we have something to show, we really are going to keep communicating uh, internally and need, as Nate said, um, a broad effort to do that. Um, but we certainly are thinking about post that time what a more formal communication strategy to the American public would be. Uh, Luis Herrera. Yes, uh, thank you. I just want to add to Martin's question. I think it's a very important one because we do get questions from various stakeholders. And, and yesterday in the audience and, and participation work stream, we did actually make some progress in trying to answer the why question. Why is this important? What does it mean to us to be engaged in? And so we're starting from just several concepts that we really haven't uh, totally detailed out and flushed out, but it's the issue of quality, it's the issue of awareness and accessibility, focusing on the cultural heritage piece, all of those aspects are going to tie into what you're talking to, uh, Martine, about that messaging that I think we all need to, we understand the concept, but if we can articulate the, the message points, uh, we'll have a much more kind of inclusive um, uh, ownership, if you will, of DPLA. And Nate, I think you did a great job of explaining how, what we're doing in terms of the user experience the segmentation and the narrative that we need to continue, but it's all kind of evolving. I think we made great progress. Yes. Great. I saw a couple hands up in this segment. We'll, uh, if we can bring some mics down, gang. Thank you for speaking into the mic. It will help with the webcast. Well. Hi, I'm Julia Marks Young. I'm from the State Archives of Mississippi, and um, I want to find out more about what kinds of institutional nodes you would like because you have 50 of them ready and waiting. Good. Yes. All right. With yes. lots of public content. Yeah. Um, and that uh, may be a, a minimum a connection between you and Rachel Frick and Maura Marks and we'll uh, uh, take you up on it. But yeah, we'll keep the mic over here. Sorry. We got... Yeah, please. My name is Jana Bradley and I'm uh, at the school and library science at the University of Arizona and in Tucson. And I would like to sort of contribute what I think is a maverick perspective. I, I heard it partly in, um, from uh, South Carolina, but not completely. My research area is in self-publishing, both POD self-publishing and now in digital self-publishing. And I think that those two things are dividing differently uh, in POD self-publishing, the real, uh, the real uh, opportunity is local content, not just uh, oral histories, but getting to people to write about their lives and experiences and having workshops. And I think that's a great uh, fit for local content and then having places, as they did in South Carolina, to, to um, uh, post that. But the other side of self-publishing is what I really believe is a going to be a fairly rapid expansion of readers who buy self-published books at this point through Amazon, but I think that's going to change. I don't quite know how. But this is a whole, uh, uh, one of my uh, uh, short research studies shows that on uh, Amazon's 100 top paid uh, books, uh, and th they do this every day, and consistently 35 to 40 percent are self-published. And, uh, and I think that if libraries somehow don't come to grips with this, we're going to find ourselves not supplying content that people want to read. Uh, there's also an opportunity here because the price points of these books are, it, it's really uh, bimodal between the, the publishers, ebooks, and the price points of self publishing, which at the top are $7.99 and are mostly lower than that. So I just put that out. I don't know how Thank it you. fits, but I want people to consider it. Thank you. We love Maverick Perspectives, among other things, and this was great. I also want to do a shout out, since you work in a library school, we've had such great support from both library students and actually schools sending students here to this event. We're really grateful um, for that active engagement. I think that is, um, in many respects, a sign of uh, great things to come for this project. Uh, sorry. Um, I just wanted to, this is Ivy Anderson from the California Digital Library. Um, I just wanted to uh, follow up on um, 
what something that the, the gentlewoman from Mississippi uh, raised, which is how states can become involved. Um, and this is a follow-up to, uh, to Susan's comment about the importance of local. And as Susan well knows, because she presides, presided over this pro program in California, um, there are models like the Local uh, History Digital Resources Program in California, which have for a long time got, uh, tried to bring local content, uh, digitize local content, and make it accessible in, in a broader way. And I think that that could be a very viable model for DPLA, something that has been developed as sort of end-to-end -end solution and could be re re replicable across multiple states. And so that may be a very, um, it's not quite the Scannabago approach, but it's uh, maybe the, a, a version of that. Ivy, thank you. And we take huge, huge inspiration from what you've done and what's happened in Massachusetts and a variety of other models that I think um, we'll build on. Um, there's a, 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 if we can head to the back there. Um, I see Emily. Uh, um, please go ahead. Yeah. Hi, this is uh, Praveen Madan again, the bookstore guy who's trying to save all the bookstores. <laughs> the, there's two stakeholder groups that I haven't heard a lot of mention about as I've gotten to know DPLA and I'm hearing all of you guys talk. Uh, so leaving bookstores aside that I've already made my pitch for, those two stakeholder groups are one is publishers, book publishers, and I'm curious to hear what kind of response and reactions are you guys getting from book publishers as you're building uh, you know, this. And, uh, and the second one, again, very important stakeholder group is writers, people who write books. I mean, there's a significant crisis in the writing community, and I'm talking about writers who don't have day jobs at libraries and uh, you know, universities like many of you do, people who used to depend on either book advances for generating an income or doing magazine and you know, newspaper writing to uh, uh, you know, generate a, uh, basically earn a living. Uh, there's a crisis because there's an expectation that you should now just be writing for free. Uh, people are going on food stamps and uh, <laughs> you know, getting jobs at cafes, at baristas. Uh, these are professional writers with the, you know, literature degrees and journalism degrees because they don't know how to earn a livelihood anymore. So what are you guys doing to reach out to publishers and to writers and make them part of this uh, you know, thinking? That's my Maybe question. if you wouldn't mind handing the mic down to a professional writer here in Doran Weber. Um, uh, yeah. But I, I was going to answer just, you know, um, OK, I would gladly take it. I'm trying to spread the wealth here of the responses. <laughs> um, we've been uh, very open arms toward both publishers and writers in uh, many respects. Um, I think that, there, as you know, both of these communities are struggling with their strategy right? In, at this moment. We would love more engagement from uh, the publishing community. And uh, we've had, I see uh, Margie Avery from MIT uh, Press who's been very, very active um, on the university presses have been uh, very much engaged. We have had a number of uh, the larger publishers participate at various points. I think there's a sense of paying attention to what's going on, but not yet jumping in with two feet to the extent that we can do that collaboratively. Absolutely, that's um, something we deeply welcome. I don't think we're going to be able, however, to be all things to all people in, in this project. And I think we do have to solve for problems that we can. We want to do it, though, in a way that's as inclusive as possible. So that is as warm a welcome as we could possibly imagine. And you know, we see this as an ecosystem of uh, production of information and creation and reuse, as well as long-term preservation and so forth. So it, we see the connection there. Um, it hasn't been the community that has been most jumping up and down to participate, although there's certainly been um, been uh, some participation in the sense of paying attention. Uh, Emily, yes? Yeah, I was just going to respond to the last question that Please. was um, asked about um, nodes and contributing. Uh, so we are actually getting ready to release a survey as soon as this um, DPLA West wraps up. And um, those of you who are actually involved in collaborative digitization um, run organizations like CDL, other kinds of statewide or collaborative projects. Please respond to that survey. You'll see it come out. We're going to try to put it out widely so that we can begin to identify all of these collaborative projects that exist and discuss the possibility of you being these nodes or these content aggregators to provide content. So look for that survey. Thank you so much. Other comments? Uh, okay. oh, thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, Todd Robbins, I'm a library student. Awesome. Um, I have a question about, so as we're working through kind of this, the balance between a repository and an aggregator, um, uh, the discussion of what is the baseline of licensing? Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, we have Creative Commons or the Open Knowledge Foundation that has open definition, various um, standards for uh, open 
data on the web is do we see the DPLA as something that hosts open content only, but then points to other licensed material, or is it, I mean, what are some of the perspectives on that? I haven't been too involved with the it, content. It's a great question, and I think there are multiple perspectives still on exactly that topic. So in terms of expectation setting, for April 2013, we're going to be working with public domain content, for starters, in part because that defers some of the harder questions, um, but also in part because we know for demonstration purposes we can do it. We have a commitment to no new restrictions through this process. So if something is digitized through an IMLS grant that mm -hmm. supports somebody doing it or the DPLA directly, there won't be new restrictions. But I think there are open questions, and this is one of the reasons that we're toggling a bit between these two. Um, of if, to the extent that something comes with some restrictions, would we be able to ingest that effectively into the DPLA or not? I think that remains one of these hard and good questions and a great one to have input from library students among others. Uh, Mackenzie, I don't know, this is something you've given a lot of thought to in a variety of contexts. Do you want to uh, address it at all? I, I think you as a lawyer are much better qualified You're very than kind. I to speak about that. <laughs> With great caution, you yeah. see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Uh, any other last seven second questions? Yes, all right. Uh, hi, I'm Emily. Um, I'm from Your Future Library. Awesome. Yourfuturelibrary.com. Um, and uh, I was just wondering, with local content specifically, which has already been discussed, local history content, that kind of thing, I was wondering who will kind of be the caretaker of it? Mm -hmm. Who makes people aware that it's there? Because right now it usually is someone in the local community yes. um, yeah. who does that, who knows about it, who knows what records are available, and often they're so obscure. You wouldn't think of them unless you already knew that they were there. So I'm curious about who will do that, especially say, I don't know, 50 years in the future or something. <laughs> I know that that's quite distant, but I guess especially as those things go more and more online and will be passed down, or how do you kind of imagine that happening in the present and future? It's a totally brilliant question. Actually, I think it's a great, it's a great one to uh, end with. Oh, would you like someone to answer it, Maura? <laughs> well, I was going to answer, but I, please bring it. No, no, please bring it down if we've got a, a mic. I can't answer on behalf of the archival community, but this is what archivists have been doing for decades, is um, appraising content. But it also it depends on the users, it depends on the context, um, and I think that's why we all have to talk about this together, and it, it shouldn't just be one person's decision. I think Does that answer your question a little bit? And just to answer it from a DPLA perspective, I think um, the way we've thought about it is that it's matter of redundancy on some level, and that's actually one of the things that's worked pretty well with the web too, to the extent that we could create a system whereby there are people who are locally collecting, adding metadata, being supported by the system and keeping versions, where we're also sharing things, perhaps in this uh, reservoir that Carl is talking about, where we can ensure that it's updated in formats and so forth, supported by standards at the national level. Um, I actually think that by working together, we may be able to put a few more uh, great professional uh, and non-professional eyes on exactly that problem going forward. So I actually think it's almost a nice metaphor for where we're headed um, for the project uh, overall. We are at time here, but um, I want to thank very much my uh, colleagues on this, um, on this panel. And to note just one thing that's crucial about this is that we have people who are working in the federal agencies, all of the big ones, and our secret weapon is Susan Hildreth. Let me tell you, she's amazing <laughs> at IMLS and has absolutely been crucial for all this. Thank you, John. <laughs> but we also have people, independent technologists working in all manner of places and uh, hardcore, fabulous public librarians um, who are crafting this project. And I think um, we, we all want more uh, active engagement, much as we've seen from Mackenzie, from Susan, and Nate. Uh, and have a wonderful lunch. We will see you back here at 1.30. Thank you so much.